Hello, I'm Penelope Maver, and welcome to Earth Converse podcast, an exploration into our conversations and relationships with the earth, all in the hope of inspiring a deeper connection with ourselves, each other, and the earth that is our home. And I'm really delighted to have Jeannie Daly Trimpe here with me. Hey! Oh, hey. So good um, to be here. Oh, so lovely. And here, yeah, it's one o'clock there, isn't it? So I'm a one o'clock in the afternoon. Yep. I'm a little bit darker there. So Boulder, Colorado, which I yeah. just adore. I love it. And I know you love it too. Yes. And uh, Judy and I, we met last year in um, Dragonback Springs Ranch where she was on the vision quest that I was co-guiding. So that was with uh, Ray and um, Emerald and Scott yep. and also Michelle. And lots in common around coaching, consulting, organizational yeah. development. And yes. then, yes, this wonderful book, which was laid out there while you went out to the land. And um, the um, uh, author of The Love Map, Reignite, Reconnect and Repair Relationships. And yeah. so you and your husband, Mark, have been very conscious around this yeah, conscious yeah. relationship and wanting yeah. to sort of heal the world through your own love. So we'll talk about that and we'll talk yeah. about what, um, your, how nature supports that love. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. So how would you introduce yourself? Yeah. Yeah, you know, that's always such a funny question. It's like, oh, what's the title, you yeah. know? Um, I think first and foremost, I really am, I'm a seeker. You know, and I've been a seeker my whole life. So everything else really stems from that. Mm -hmm. I think that those of us who are, you know, for more of a professional role, I would say I'm, I'm a coach. I'm a relationship coach. Um, obviously, I'm an author. I'm a teacher. Everything, though, stems from my own personal quest. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what makes us good at what we do, right? It's like we have, we have our own burning desire our, to grow, our own curiosity. And mm -hmm. from that, everything else kind of ripples out into the world. So I'd, mm -hmm. I'd say, first of all, I, I am a seeker for mm -hmm. sure. And so what you, know, what you do is what you are, you know? It's, there's no sort of blurring of those sort of, you know, private and professional. It's just totally immersed in that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. What, what are you seeking? You know, I think that's, that's a good question, isn't it? It's like, if you're seeking, you have to be seeking something. Um, what is it? It's, it's like expanding into the full capacity of who I am as a human being. And at one point I looked at, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs where self-actualization is at the top. And I was like, you know, for me, it's soul actualization. Yeah, and so the right. question is, what is my soul here to contribute to the world and how can I keep taking layers off mm -hmm. so that I am as like clear as I can be in the world so that my soul can just shine through mm -hmm. so that's really what I'm seeking it's like this purity of soul that is the giveaway that I came here to do in this lifetime mm -hmm. when you say that and then sort of even the picking off it reminds me of Rumi's quote you know don't seek the love but seek to remove all the barriers you've you created against yeah. it, you know, taking up the, yeah. you know, the dragon scales and being that pure and that clarity and yeah. yeah. So how did, where did that yeah. start? Where did that seeking start? Or what's your sort of... Yeah, you know, so when I was a kid, I think a lot of us who were on some sort of conscious spiritual path um, grew up in a family where we didn't quite feel like we fit in. Do you know? Can you relate? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people can relate to that. And I read you know, like 20 years ago when the book um, Women Who Run With the Wolves first wow. came out by Clarissa Pinkola Estes. And she had this concept in there that, that she refers to as the mistaken zygote. And that a lot of us feel like, like this is the family I was born into. <laughs> like, are you sure? I think I, maybe this isn't the right family. Um, so I grew up in kind of, you know, really a normal dysfunctional family, but a family where I felt like I, like, these people don't really get who I am. So I was on my own a lot. I played by myself a lot. And I grew up in Washington state. So we had a lot of rain. But as much as I could, I, I went outside, you know, and so it's like the, the outside world really became um, my, my friends, like I had some trees, we had beautiful, gorgeous trees in the Northwest. Mm -hmm. And I had one tree in particular that I would climb into and I would like sit in the V of this tree and it would hold me. And it was literally like this tree was my friend. 
and um, you know, I would dig up worms and I would play in the dirt. I remember this one story. We would go to the eastern part of Washington to be with my grandmother for a couple of weeks during the summer. And we came back, we had this great cherry tree in the front yard. And I would pick the cherries and you know, again, it was like the tree was my friend. Well, we came back and the tree was gone. My dad had cut the tree down. And apparently it was, you know, it was diseased and it was gonna die and he had to cut it down, but he didn't tell me. And I was distraught. I mean, I remember, I must've been like eight years old. I was beside myself with grief because it felt like a friend had died and I didn't get to say goodbye. And no one told me that this tree was gonna be cut down while we were gone. And I felt this betrayal. Like, how could you do this without telling me? I didn't even get to say goodbye. And my family just thought I was weird, <laughs> you know, they were like, okay, you're taking this a little bit too seriously. It was just a tree. Uh, and I'm like, oh, you guys just don't get it. Yeah. yeah. Which adds to the pain, not only the pain of the yeah. tree, but the pain of not being seen and not that grief, not being recognized. And, yeah. and, and was that the first death, the, the earliest memory of death? I'm just thinking of like the, the living and dying horse that Meredith Little ran. She goes, you know, what's your first experience of death? Yeah, you know, as a matter of fact, it may have been. It's the first thing. The reason why I'm thinking of it is because I was doing a meditation recently and it came up and I actually cried in the meditation. It's like I, I never got to fully release all the grief. And so I was doing oh, wow. a grieving meditation around this tree. So, um, yeah, it was very poignant for me. And I was very clear early on that mm -hmm. trees were living beings and they were my friends because they held me. Mm -hmm. You had, yeah, you had evidence. You had been held. Yeah. 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 Wow. And then, yeah. And how did it involve? How did your, that sort of um, even relationship or this family of trees evolve yeah. for your life? You know, it's funny because my family wasn't into the outdoors. So we didn't go camping. Um, the rare occasions that we would go to Mount Rainier, I would just be enthralled, like, oh my God, this is the most beautiful place I've ever seen, the mountains. And um, we had a, a creek that ran behind our house. It was about half a mile away. And when I was growing up, it was an open field and there was just a barn and horses. And as much as I could, I would walk down to this creek and I would pick blackberries and I would walk in the cold water. And, you know, again, it was just like this magical childhood mm -hmm. and then again here's my next maybe grieving mm -hmm. moment that I remember when I was 11 that whole field got transformed into a subdivision and houses got built mm -hmm. and they blocked off the access to the creek it was all lined with houses and I couldn't get to the creek anymore and again I remember being so sad like really devastated like how is this possible how can how can anyone block off access to this? You know, it was my, my world was small yeah. at the time I was a child, yeah. but it was, you know, how, how could they do this? How could this be blocked? And also not being again told or informed or part of that and then literally cut off, literally. Yeah. 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 And then, um, you know, when I finally got out of the house and, and went to college, I got involved in, we had a college outdoors program. And I finally felt like I found myself. Mm -hmm. And every weekend I could, I was camping, I was backpacking, I was, you know, leading other trips with the incoming freshmen, you know, and I really started um, stepping into a leadership role in terms mm -hmm. of the outdoors. And um, at, at one point I got trained to be a whitewater raft guide. And so I was, mm -hmm. I was really involved in the outdoor world not yet from really a spiritual perspective, but mm -hmm. certainly from a, like, it's where I found myself, yeah. you know, it's, it's how I feel like I grew into knowing who I was at that time. Mm -hmm. And that connection and belonging, and I guess, sort of gathering the people that, yeah, your tribe or yeah. people that enjoyed that. Mm. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Cause sometimes I think, you know, when we're so different from our families of origin, we have to, it's, it's the classic difference between your actual family and your chosen family, right? And, and a lot of times those are just different people and that's okay, mm. you know? Mm. And from the, the spiritual, how did it go from the outdoors and just enjoying, which so many people do, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So what happened, it's kind it's an interesting story. I've never been a very linear person, mm -hmm. right? You know, some people kind of have their lives planned out and they know what they're going to do. And I was never that person. I was the only person in my family that wasn't that way. So I remember a few years after I'd graduated from college, I didn't know what I was doing with my life, right? I just had no idea. And I, so I went back to the college guidance counselor and I said, help, what do I do? And her answer was really funny, thinking back on it. She asked me, she said, well, what's your five-year plan? And I was like, oh my God, I'm supposed to have a five-year plan. <laughs> like, what is that? So I did, I put together this five-year plan. Ah. And yeah, it included, um, I wanted to go and volunteer in a developing country and learn Spanish. I wanted to go to graduate school. And then I thought after that, because I've always known that, that I'm a teacher, mm -hmm. I thought I would teach like in the, in the system, like at a community college or something. Mm -hmm. So I went through that whole plan. I, I lived in El Salvador for a year, which was an amazing experience. Mm, wow. volunteering. Yeah. Uh, I went to graduate school and during graduate school, I had an opportunity to teach the undergraduate students like in a classroom setting, which mm -hmm. is kind of what I thought. Right. And I had previous to that, I'd done all kinds of outdoor education stuff. Right. So here I was in a classroom. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, it is funny, actually. I'm glad, I'm glad you're laughing already. Because it is, it is like, really? Like, isn't it funny? Yeah. Yes. Yes. You yeah. can even just see my hands yeah. just going from, I was, you know, and, and before that I'd been, I was like a ropes course facilitator, you know, I, I was helping people expand their boundaries and jump off of things 40 feet in the air. And in the classroom, what I found is that there was this, this just narrow focus, right? And the narrow focus from the perspective of the, the, the system and the students were they wanted to get an A. Mm -hmm. and, and I was like, but we're doing all these, I built in all these community service projects into the <laughs> curriculum because the class I was teaching was called small group communication, right? Because that's what I got my master's degree in is communication. And I wanted them to actually work together and do a project that would benefit the community. Well, they hated it. They hated it. It was too much work. Uh, anyway, it, I could go on and on. But the, the end result of this story is I didn't like it. I realized I went ahead and graduated. I got my master's degree. And at the end of it, um, I moved to Boulder for the first time. This was way back in 1998. And I was depressed for a year because I had done the five-year plan yes. and it yeah. didn't work, <laughs> right? So here I was living in Boulder. And you I, chose I, Boulder because? I had felt drawn to Boulder mm -hmm. and Colorado for years. I didn't even know why, but for probably about four years, I had been, as soon as I'm done with my degree, I'm moving to Boulder. And it was just this draw. Mm -hmm. It honestly was just... I was like, I have to be there. That's where I'm supposed to be. So um, that was kind of the only thing I knew at the end of this five-year plan falling apart was that I'm going to move to Boulder and then we'll see, right? Well, at the, end of, at the end of this year where I had really been depressed, I was temping because I didn't want to get a job. I was afraid that if I got a job, I'd get stuck in the system, you know, and, and not be doing what, I, what my heart was really calling me to do. So a friend said to me, she said, Jean, do you realize you've been depressed every time I've talked to you for a year? I think you need to do something. And it was a wake-up call for me. I was like, well, she's right. I have been depressed. And the only thing that I knew to do was to go and be in nature. Literally, I was like, I've got to go be in nature. I don't even really know what that means. So I went to the Boulder bookstore and I was like, where are your books on nature therapy? I mean, at the time, I, I didn't even have the word. Yeah, 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 you know? yeah. So they pointed me to the section, and the, you're going to appreciate the The book I found was called The Book of the Vision Quest oh, by yeah. Stephen Foster and Meredith Little. I didn't you know. You are kidding. It. No, I'm not. I'd never I heard of them. I think they put it actually on mainstream. It was just under the um, Lost Borders Press. So, no, it was know. in the Boulder bookstore. Yeah. And I didn't know who they were. I had never heard of them at the time. And I read this book and I was like, that's it. I'm sending myself out on a vision quest. <laughs> right. So I did. And that was, I was actually just telling Mark this yesterday because it's almost, it was in late September that I did my first vision quest and it's yeah. been 23 years now. Oh my goodness. Right? It's like I know. Knox, Knox, there's something, yeah. 
Did yes. You yes. Equinox? It was right around Equinox and it was a full moon. Mm -hmm. And it was like the most magical thing I had ever done. Even though I didn't have a tribe to send me out yeah, and come yeah. back, it was still, I was like, I mean, I remember walking around. I was at, I found this little lake up in Northern Colorado and it was full moon. And I, I found this, this lament song, just, mm. just, I just made it up in the moment. And I walked around this little lake and I sang to the full moon and it was so beautiful. And I, pr I prayed for a name for a medicine name. And in the morning I woke up and there was this new name that had come and it was, I'm getting goosebumps even just uh, remembering yes, it. Yes, so yeah. that was my, that was the, really the first experience that I had had in nature that was more ceremonial and spiritual. And it, you know, it changed the course of my life at that point. Oh so, my goodness. Yeah. You know, like where that, that depression or not even probably recognizing it, but then being sort of, you know, your friend highlighting sort of mirroring that back and then you intuitively going it's the nature thing and i'm and i do i believe that we'll always come across the right people the book or the you know podcast <laughs> that we do yeah just, in that moment isn't it and you just isn't that incredible and then yeah. you just then you know then intuitively going out there you know as opposed to sort of signing up you know it's sort of like actually you are truly from your own self, I can do this. No, it, Go was, out. it was a great introduction. And then I realized that the piece was missing and the piece that was missing for me was community. Yeah. And so six months later, I actually did a guided vision fast. And then I kept doing them every six months for like six years. It was ridiculous. I just did, I was like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I went out on the land just recently and it was sort of like, um, I, I wanted to ask people who do them regularly, like every year, because it's sort of like, you know, you have the vision and it's sort of like, well, the next vision is like, we're well, stick, stick to the same one, just do it. You know, what is the point of going out for doing vision, vision quest after vision quest? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a great question. At the time, I think I was a little manic, right? I was like, I, 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 I All or nothing. It was like the vision quest high, you know, if one is good, 12 is even better. Um, but, you know, it was funny. It's like I had just, I got on that rhythm of every, every six months. Um, it's intense. It is intense, which is why I, I got burned out. And then I didn't do a vision fast for a number of years. Um, so, you know, I did the month long training with Stephen and Meredith back in the day, which was amazing. What they recommended is that you go out once a year, especially if you're, if you're guiding. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because, and I think this is great wisdom, we, we, carry, we carry the stories of people with us. And mm -hmm. so whether we are actually, you know, whether we're a wilderness guide or we're, we're coaching people, whatever it is, or we're a therapist, you carry those stories yeah. with you. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean, right? Mm, yeah. And so doing a vision fast is actually a way to lay down the stories that you've been carrying so that you don't take any of that on as your own burden. Mm. And so it's your personal practice of emptying out mm. so that you can fill yourself up again with nature and continue on with your good work in the world. Yeah, that, so. that intuitively makes sense with the sort of the therapeuticness or you know, sort of in coaching terms, the supervision or the, yeah, yeah, the emptying out, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, um, you know, when I went out last year, it was to mark my elderhood yes. at 50, which was amazing. And that's been unfolding with me this year in a beautiful way. The grandmothers are with me every single day. And, um, you know, for me as a transpersonal resources, you know, they, they guide me, they they tell me sometimes what to do. They hold me in meditation. And now in two months time, Mark and I are going out together to do the great ball court and um, ceremonially die. So it's an intense path, but you know. <laughs> Just a normal day-to-day -day couple. Um, yeah, probably a bold in Colorado in a normal couple. <laughs> um, actually that's the, because 52, but isn't it the Mayan, um, they did the ball court every 52 years. So you'll be 52. 
I will be almost 52. I, I will turn 52 a couple weeks after we get back. Yeah, yeah. 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 Cause I'm gonna, cause I, I just found out that out the 52 thing. So I thought I might do it when I'm 52. Oh, oh wow, wow. So yeah, so this beautiful, so I mean, before I go into you, you and Mark and consciously, you know, doing this together, yes. what, um, from all those experiences, is it, um, anything else you want to share? Is it just the, yeah, the literally the emptying out, the filling, the, you know, you, you did this intensive um, sort of <laughs> session and then had to pull back and not do one yeah. for a while. But how did it all weave its way um, throughout? Yeah, I think for me, the practice of, vision fasts and medicine walks, right? So your listeners probably know what medicine walks are, but it's, you know, going out into nature with a question and listening. That has been a through line for me. So even in the years that I haven't done a vision fast, I'm consistently going to the land as one of my main resources for support. And so it's, you know, for the last 23 years, it's been, it's been, one of my top three primary spiritual practices is that um, it's not only the emptying out, but it's the filling back up. It's, it's the listening in a different way. It's the hearing guidance when I feel stuck in the own whirlwind of my own mind and confusion. It's asking for guidance and being open enough to listen, whether it's to a tree or the ancestors, or it's just um, yeah, I, I don't even know who I would be without that as a practice, you know, like I, it's, it's so much a part of who I am. I'm not sure how I would be if I didn't have that. And how have you, um, weaved that before transformative loving, is it? Yeah. Transformative loving. Yep. Mm -hmm. Before you set that up, because you and Mark set that up. Didn't you? Yeah. yeah. Yep. So before, it's before, before Mark, BM, um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, how did you weave it into your, you know, yeah, your consultancy, your work? How did you weave that or how did it manifest itself? You know, this deep nature-based wisdom and practice. Yeah. So after I did the month-long training with Stephen and Meredith, I did lead a couple of, I co-led a couple of fasts um, when I was living in California. And um, I was still facilitating um, ropes course programs at that time. So I was still doing some nature-based work, but honestly, it was more of a personal practice for me. Mm -hmm. And I didn't so much weave it into my professional work because at, at that time I was starting to segue into working with organizations mm -hmm. and doing leadership development and organizational development. And so I kept it almost like a close, like I, I guarded it kind of closely to my heart and you know, this is something I still struggle with. It's because I still work with the mainstream world, right? I still do executive coaching. And sometimes I struggle with how much of my own personal practices do I bring into my coaching with others? Now it's easier when we start talking about the relationship work, but when I'm talking about executive coaching, I, I feel like I've almost had this wall between, okay, here's the mainstream world that I coach over mm -hmm. here and then here's my own personal practices. And I don't know how open this world is to this mm -hmm. world. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Mm. So I think I have had a little bit of challenge between weaving those two worlds together and actually in transformative loving is the place where I feel like I can, can do it. Do it. It's, and that's it's where I, I bring everything. So yes. everything, yeah. whether it's communication skills from the, you know, that I teach in the corporate world to the more esoteric practices, I can weave it all in together. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why I love it so much because I feel like I can bring all of who I am to the work, like finally, you know. Right. Mainstream this work would be great, wouldn't it? I think because yeah. there's so much in terms of that holisticness, you know, how we can live our true self, what we are, what we do. And actually in terms of, just the whole environmental sustainability connection with ourselves, connection with each other, connection with the earth is all related. Um, and, but I think there is some sort of sacredness or specialness and I can understand why you're keeping it. You know, it's my own little secret there. Um, and I think it's more, Oh, how do I put it? I think it's important when we work with people, whether it's, you know, whatever label you want to put on yourself, guide, coach, therapist, teacher, 
that we meet people where they are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I have been reluctant to put too much of my own belief system and spiritual practices yeah. on people when it doesn't seem like they are ready. Mm -hmm. um, there have been some executive coaching clients that I've worked with over a number of months where I have given them a medicine walk to do. Now I haven't called it a medicine walk, mm -hmm. right? But I have yeah. said, um, you know, I know you're sitting with this question, you're really struggling with it. Why don't you, uh, you know, take it on a walk in nature mm -hmm. and don't think about it, right? Don't, don't try to rationalize your way out of the problem, but just hold the question lightly and just be open and see if something different comes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah. you know, for me being kind of a bridge between the personal growth and the professional development world, I have to language things differently. Yeah. Communicating and to meet the people where they are and using the different languages and the terminology. Um, because yeah, it can get a bit woo woo, but actually, yeah, yeah that medicine words walk versus, you know, something much more, yeah, yeah, explore it in a you know, intuitive exactly. way or, yeah. yeah. So yeah. tell yeah, so um tell us uh tell us about transformative loving and the story of Mark and you consciously yeah. choosing each other. I think this is just so beautiful. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's certainly it's been a journey for mm -hmm. sure. Um when I was back in my 30s, I read a book on conscious relationship by John Wellwood called Journey to the Heart. And it was the most beautiful thing I had read about relationships up until that point. And I was like, wow, people do this. <laughs> like <laughs> they enter in together <laughs> into a conscious relationship and, and do their personal growth work together. Wow. <laughs> you know, because up until that point, a lot of the practices we talk about are solo practices. You know, they're go out on the land by yeah. yourself for four days and fast and sit on a cushion and meditate. Like, you know, one point I did a 10 day Vipassana meditation mm. where you're in silence for 10 days. Mm. And all of those practices I did on my own were of course helpful, helpful to my own development and unfolding. But when I was, let's see, Mark and I met when I was, thir I was 39 and he was 45 and he had been divorced and I had not been married before. And so the thing that was the most important to me was to be with a man who was on his own conscious mm -hmm. personal growth mm -hmm. path mm -hmm. and to bring our two paths together to see how we could really intertwine them. And so from the beginning, we actually set that as an intention for our relationship was to be on a personal and spiritual growth path together. And uh, you know, it's been a wild ride. It's not like it's, you know, I think sometimes when I say that, people say, oh, you must be all love and light and bliss buddies. I'm like, no, no, it's been incredibly hard work, yeah. you know, it's like kind of like, be careful what you ask for. But, uh, you know, we got married about uh, less, less than two years after we met. Because you made a our, personal, sorry, sorry to interrupt, you made a personal development, literally. So we yeah. did. Yeah, we met in a personal growth workshop, mm -hmm. which is how I knew he'd be into personal <laughs> growth, right? <laughs> Tip number one, if you're single, go to a personal growth workshop. <laughs> um, but, you know, when we got married, one of our wedding vows was, um, you know, I walk the path of our marriage as a personal and spiritual growth path. And, um, and also another one was our relationship is a blessing to the world. Mm. So we have done our best. We've been married for 10 years now to really walk that, to be an inspiration to, he has two kids. So to his kids, to how to do things differently, yeah. um, you know, for people around us. We also, you know, I have some single women that I've coached to help them be on the path towards finding mm. conscious relationship. And it's beautiful work, you know, I, I really do feel like I can bring in all of these threads that I've learned in different ways throughout the year and they all, they all come together in how do we have more conscious partnerships. Mm -hmm. So that's the essence of the work is really deepening our relationship with other as part of our uh, personal and spiritual growth. Wonderful. I, um, in your videos, you see anything happens in relationship. So it's yeah. a natural home for our healing, isn't it? Everything does happen in relationship. You know, we have, um, we have this belief that we choose a partner who is 
like somebody in our family, right? And so for me, oftentimes we think, oh, it, it would be like my dad because that's my, no, no, I chose my mom. <laughs> So Mark is a combination of my mom and my middle sister. And, but the, and, and of course I am his mom, unfortunately, yeah. I'm his mom. It just works out that way. So yeah. we're working out mom issues in our relationship, right? <laughs> but, but even the, that's great, isn't it? Just yeah. That, you know? yeah, yeah, for sure. We're so aware of it. We're so painfully aware of it. Yeah. Um, but the key is that the partner has to be different enough from that original wounding that there's hope for healing this time. And I believe that's what we're actually doing in partnership is that we're searching for somebody who they're alike enough mm -hmm. to the original bonding person, but they're different enough mm -hmm. that we go, aha, I can do this differently this time. And my partner's actually going to show up and as a co-healer. Mm -hmm. So we co-heal each other. Mm -hmm. So that's the belief. Wow, so it's just enough for the projection and the hook, and then the yeah, but then the hope is to, for that evolution, so we don't, you know, another generation doesn't. Do the exactly, same. exactly. The I mean, I mean, the ancestors or the it's true, the, it is, it is ancestral healing, absolutely. I mean, I can give you a specific example. So, um, Mark's mom is, uh, is a similar personality style to me, like very like energetic and. Uh, kind of intense, have a tendency, like the first emotion I go to is often anger. <laughs> his mom's the same way. But the thing is, his mom is not available for any deeper conversations mm -hmm. about what's going on and why. And I am, I mean, we do a lot of that and we do a lot of pulling things apart and really deep listening and sitting in council together and going out on the land to listen together. And because we do that growth work, our relationship is totally different. And we have shown up in a way to be healers for each other. And that really makes all the difference. Mm. And where's the difference between sort of being a healer and you know you're there to heal as opposed to just the playful joyful i love you you know for who you are and the great you know great question. And, yeah i think um you know for mark and i what we have found is that we play a number of different roles a number of different roles and the thing for us that we have to be careful not to get caught in is because we we do feel like we're healers for each other sometimes we have to turn that off and go, okay, we're going to have raunchy sex now. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and it's yeah. actually because sometimes we've found that it can, it can dampen the mm -hmm. sexual energy mm -hmm. more than anything, right? Yeah. We have tons of play and joy. That's, mm -hmm. that's not our issue. But sometimes when we get so in depth in these healing conversations or, you know, like spiritual modalities, the sex can kind of, sexual energy can leave. So we have to make sure that we have different ways that we are together, mm -hmm. because I do think you can fall into like one way and some couples fall into being more like brother and sister yeah. or, or um, like they're just living together as roommates. And so to watch for that in relationship, like are we cultivating all the aspects of who we are together and, and not just getting stuck in this one thing that we do. Mm. And just the unlimited sort of potentials and all different parts of us. And yeah. So how do you, um, how does it also work where I can imagine that you're doing the work and then maybe you go off the land and you come back, you know, in terms of yeah. where you both are. Be like a theme that we're working with in our relationship mm -hmm. and we'll get, we'll get stuck in it. Like maybe there's something that we can't see. So we'll agree, we'll, we'll say, let's take this, let's take this to the land. And we'll go to one of our, you know, 10 favorite trails here in Boulder and we'll find a place to sit. And so we usually both go out, often we both go out with the same question. Sometimes we go out with different questions and we'll sit and we do this at least once a week, if not two or three times a week. I mean, this is a consistent practice for us. And so I think one of the things I would say is it doesn't have to be a long time. Like it doesn't have to be an hour. If we do these 15 minute sits mm -hmm. with one question and then we come back together and we're like, oh my gosh, guess what I heard, you know? Like, guess what I, and then we share. And even if we 
sometimes we hear very different messages, but there's always some way that they weave together and they give us um, a different understanding of whatever it is that we're sitting with in the moment. Um, and a side benefit that we've noticed to doing this practice is we're so much more aligned energetically than when we don't, right? So if there goes, if, if there's goes through a number of months or something and we don't do these practices, mm -hmm. we can really get out of yeah. sync. Mm -hmm. But if we're sitting on the land together, like we'll be driving in the car, you know, kind of in, silent in our own thoughts and I'll be thinking about something and Mark will say, hey, what do you think about X, Y, Z? And I'll be like, oh my God, I was just thinking yeah. about that. Yeah. And that happens all the time. Yeah. And what we make up about that is that because we sit on the land together is that we're in sync and we're literally tuning into, sometimes it's scary. I'm like, can you get out of my brain? Yeah. Please? <laughs> yeah. yeah. What's something little secret. Mm. Yeah. You, yeah. So to what extent is nature that can, that nurtures you, you know, is it the, I'm not putting words in your mouth. I, don't, I hope not, but sort of the main, yeah. Hold yeah. or observer so, or guide. Or... Here's, how, here's how it ties into relationship work. Mm -hmm. So in relationship work right now, attachment style theory is kind of all the rage, right? You hear people talking about, are you anxious? Are you avoidant? Are you disorganized? Do you have a secure attachment? And really one of the goals of being in a healthy partnership is being able to come back to a place of uh, self-regulation. Mm -hmm. Okay. We, we would call it self-regulation or with your partner, it's co-regulation. Mm -hmm. So originally, right, the wounding happened within our family of origin with usually either our mother or our father. And there was some disruption to that bonding, right? Um, Dr. Sue Johnson, who does emotionally focused therapy, she says that we're actually primarily, we're not homo sapiens, we're homo vinculum, which means bonding animals. Ah. Vinculum. And I love that word. Nice. Right? And so it's like yeah. that comes first. The bonding instinct is our primary mechanism as human beings. So if you, if you think about that and you bring in the natural world, nature mm. is a natural co-regulator. Mm -hmm. Right. And so there's all these theories about, you know, how do we get back to co-regulation and self-regulation? And for me, it's like, well, hello, nature is the cheapest therapy there is. <laughs> right there. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Because when we talk about eco-psychology at its essence, what it is, is we regulate through being in nature. Human beings find wholeness through being in nature. So when we bring that into our relationship, then I don't have to only look to myself to regulate myself. I don't have to only look to my partner to co-regulate. I now have a third, what we would call a transpersonal ally mm -hmm. or a transpersonal resource, mm -hmm. a resource mm -hmm. that helps me regulate. It helps Mark regulate and it co-regulates our relationship. Mm -hmm. So nature is actually this natural healing force around when you're talking about attachment style, because it helps us come back to a place of, calms out our nervous system it helps us feel like we're i mean literally rather than if the wounding happened with the original physical mama the healing happens with the earth mama you know beautiful, Jamie. so yeah oh that's beautiful yeah does that make sense mm, it does it does and so do you I, work okay mm. well i was just gonna say i think a lot of times couples try to do this they try to do everything on their own yeah they're, you know, we're insulated in these little nuclear families and these little couple ships, but there's so, so many resources available, right? So you might have family members or friends as interpersonal resources, but sometimes what couples forget is this whole realm of the transpersonal resources that support us. Whether you think of that as like, we have a relationship angel that we bring in when we do counsel, um, or uh, the ancestors who we also work with. But nature is one of the main easy, I mean, wherever you are, you can get out with your partner and be on the land. You know, whether or not you sit in ceremony and are doing some, you know, some sort of intentional, let's sit with this question, even just walking together in nature is automatically co-regulating both of you. It's so easy. And I feel like it's the untapped secret of the relationship world is it's like, yes, just go, lovely, just go to nature. Lovely. Yeah. And you, but you'd automatically feel it, isn't it? I mean, it's so embodied in, in that. And actually, um, 
I'm also aware, and I mentioned this with uh, Scott, about how, how the natural world is a source of trauma or fear for so many. And I've been very alert now to the racism in the outdoors and, you know, where actually, you know, the, uh, the white privilege that exists in mm. terms of public lands. And I mean, I know, you know, to what extent, you know, nature, we're surrounded by nature right now at some sort of level. Um, yeah. But the wild nature and those public lands where we, that can be much more accessible is also a yeah. place of, yeah, a, a big wound for many. Yeah. Um, have you come That's, across that? And well, um, not, not so much. But what it reminds me of is when I was working with Stephen and Meredith, and I remember one of the big teachings for me was uh, nature can be a tree in your local park, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to mean going to like literally the wilderness mm -hmm. area. And so, you know, I guess I would like to think that we all have access to like a tree at least, right? You know, I'm thinking back to my little girl who loved to climb a tree and that we can maybe, you know, maybe not everybody can walk to a park, but that we could easily get to a park where there's like a rock or a tree and that I, I hope anyway that we have more access to nature than, you know, have, having to go and do a backpack trip mm -hmm. or something, but that we, look, that we look for it where it is, you know. Mm -hmm. So, but I, you know, I totally I hear what you're saying. And mm -hmm. um, that might be a blind spot on my part mm -hmm. of not having as much awareness that it is, it is a privilege for me. Well, it certainly is a privilege to be in Boulder yeah. where I have access to 12 different hiking trails. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, I, I, I am definitely very privileged. Um, and if I, you know, if I lived in Denver, it would be a different experience, right? There would be a handful of city parks I would go to mm -hmm. and, and I wouldn't be able to get to the mountains as easily as I can now for sure. Mm. Have you experienced, if you've lived in sort of, you know, in terms of that nature, the same sort of experience by it, by a tree or a rock or you know close in? Have you had the same? Do you get the same feeling yourself? Yeah, I hug trees all the time. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. I know it sounds silly because I literally am a tree hugger. <laughs> I am too. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's cliche, but. Like I, I can see like seven different trees looking out my window right now. And um, yeah, I will go and hug a tree. And especially if I'm feeling ungrounded, you know, if something's happened and I'm feeling stressed out or ungrounded, I will literally go and hug a tree. Mm -hmm. And for me anyway, my experience is if I sit with that, and again, it doesn't take very long. It's just a few minutes. I can feel myself drop in. I can feel my energy in my feet. I can feel the tree. And there's, that is what I describe as that co-regulation experience, you know, and it happens quickly for me anyway. It happens in a few minutes. Yeah. And I suppose it's also conscious practice that you've been doing with that meditation or just that awareness and presence. But I felt that in terms of COVID um, lockdown, it was a very strict lockdown here in Spain. Mm. And I just have a terrace. And I literally like became, you know, where the connection sort of, yeah, seeing my own uh, space or as uh, a spectrum of manufacture to nature, to, to pure nature, or mm. just, you know, with, that, with the clouds or the touch of the breeze or the rain yeah. or, you know, even sometimes sticking my finger in the pot plant, whatever, in the pot plant soil, you know, whatever it took to just feel yeah. the rawness. Yeah, yeah, just to just to regulate. It was about that. Yes, Thank yes. You for that word because it really was that. Yeah. Right? Um, so how do you are you working with? Um, do you take out uh, couples or relationships or people to, to explore this relationship in in nature? Mm. Yeah. So there's a there's a few different ways we work with people. So we do mm. we do singles relationship. Uh, coaching and as part of that you know right now almost everything's online just because yeah. of the nature of the world um, but I will send people out on medicine walks right so I have a woman I'm working with right now and she was not quite clear on her relationship with the masculine and she wanted to explore this like like what is the masculine in me and so we designed that as a medicine walk okay. and she went out and she you know found a place to sit outside and she sat with this question and she watched the water and she noticed what happened and she came back with this great story. So, you know, there's mm. all kinds of things we can do in not being with people. Right. Mm. And so that's one way of working with singles. Um, 
with couples, there's a program we haven't launched yet because of everything that's going on, but we're calling it a couple's quest. Now it's not the same as doing a full blown four day go off by yourself because that's a different, right? There's lots of places where you can go do that. So this is more council based. And so we do a lot of council practice, medicine walks, coming back, sharing with your partner, sharing with the larger group. Mm -hmm. And then there's a, a 12 hour solo. So it's mm -hmm. basically, it's, a, it's what we would call a day walk, right? Mm -hmm. So from sunrise to sunset and agree with your partner on what the question is, right? What questions do you want to take out about your relationship and then hold it lightly as you go through your 12 hours and then come back, sleep on it overnight without sharing Lovely. it. Let it yeah. incubate. Yeah. And then in the morning we come together and have an intentional sharing and that program we end with um, ceremony. So it might be, you might do a recommitment ceremony with your partner. Or there might just be a little piece of something that you want to commit to. So it's really um, a ceremonial based program where we incorporate nature and deep listening into um, having the relationship be more connected. Oh my goodness. That sounds fabulous. Sign Doesn't up now. Really. <laughs> Doesn't it? I absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. What a beautiful. And I can imagine, I don't know, even in, these times which must be straining for for relationships there's lots oh, yeah. of people that are really deepening but also needing to disconnect but there's a i mean i can imagine it'll be that lovely a lovely ceremony and uh practice uh, and you know i think sometimes couples like i said earlier they're either they either try to tough it out on their own or they wait until things get so bad that they <laughs> go, go see a therapist you know and by that point they're on their way to splitting up. So there's a lot of middle ground there. There's a lot of middle ground. And the way we think about relationships is how can you ongoingly cultivate your connection and work through the little, you know, the little conflicts that we all have so that it doesn't get to the point where you're like tearing your hair out, right? And you're like, do I even want to be with this person anymore? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot that couples can do in between to resource themselves um, so that they don't feel alone and they're getting support along the way. And I love just in terms of the, the wider community and we explored a little bit with, with Scott about the ancestors, but I love the relationship angel or, you know, thinking about couples that do, you know, I always think of couples that I really, you know, admire or good role models or, or stories from out there that are really yeah. help remind you uh that you're not alone in, the, in that time. yeah for sure well i mean for me stephen and meredith were my role models you know when i studied with them 20 something years ago i was like i want that like i want what they have they're amazing and i remember stephen said to me it's not as easy as it looks <laughs> And I don't know if I'm sharing stories from your quest, but I remember you losing that that part of the necklace. I did. I lost the necklace that and Stephen being, gave. Yeah. And so I distraught was, about that yes, because it was I this was. But then also you realizing that you and Mark have that. You know, you are your yeah. own equivalent of yeah. this beautiful conscious yeah. relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. True. Yeah. Um, I do. Is it okay? Can I talk about the book yes. for a minute? Please. I want to. Yes. Can you please? Yes. Okay. So one of the things that Stephen said that inspired me back in the day was you can put anything on the wheel. <laughs> anything. Yeah. He's like, you, you can put, you know, like uh, education on the wheel. You could put racism on the wheel. You could put, you know, you could take any concept and kind of put it over this map of, of the directions and explore what that means. Mm. So it, I got inspired to put love on the wheel. On the wheel, on the wheel. And that's basically what I did. So mm -hmm. this book, The Love Map, actually explores, um, and I don't like reading boring books, right? So I wrote it as a story. So it's the journey of this young couple who is going to see a counselor and she helps them walk through the wheel um, of what it is to be in relationship. Mm. and. Can I just, I, I will, in terms of listeners about the wheel, there's been several people that have talked about the wheel, but in your yes. word, words, yeah, the wheel. Like, what is the wheel? Mm. So, it's so funny because it's like a huge teaching, isn't it? How do you yeah. say it in a few sentences? Yeah. 
So to me, the wheel is looking at, it's a lens for looking at whatever you're looking at from a four directional model that's nature based, where you look at, for example, right, northeast, south, and west. And you're looking at it from a perspective of movement, of cycles of life, right? And so, for example, with, with love or relationships, you know, I, I start in the East in this book and it's looking at, okay, so there's, there's the birth of a relationship and now we're in, we're in falling in love, which is, that's the part of the relationship wheel that everybody loves. It's <laughs> you get drugged up. I mean, for real, it's better than the, you know, the reason why they created ecstasy as a drug is to mimic this falling in love <laughs> because the drugs are so powerful. The, the problem is, is when we think those drugs should be ever present, right? Omnipresent in the relationship all the time. And as we know, it's just not like that. So there's a fall, right? There's a fall off the pedestal of the love drugs and we go into the West, right? And the West is the place where obviously it's, it's sunset. It's like the darkness starts to come and it's looking at those deeper, sometimes soul issues, right? Sometimes we go through the dark night of the soul in a relationship and it's like, wow, we have all this wounding we're bringing in. Can we actually heal each other? Are we just rewounding each other? Um, and it's painful, right? It's that place where you're in the relationship and the connection becomes painful. And so here's what I love about the love map is when you start to come out the other side of the West, moving into the North, there's a choice point. And the choice point either keeps you on the pain map or yeah. it puts you love map. Mm. And the choice that I think we're not always aware of is, am I willing to do my own work around this? Right. And so can I look at myself? Can I look at what's coming up for me and not just blame my partner? Because if we stay in a place of blame, we're going to stay on the pain map no matter what. So there's like this doorway of personal growth and healing. And then once we can both go through that doorway, we land in the North, which is mature love right it's different from the south which was the infatuation mm -hmm. falling in love which we love right mm -hmm. but now we're in mature love and in the mature love the questions and the perspective are totally different and we start to bring in the tools of sitting on the land or doing a meditation together and it's like wow how can our relationship actually serve the world yeah. and the questions are totally different it's not so self-centered it's like what is our, what is our yeah. giveaway? Yes. What is the giveaway of the relationship? And the Which reverberations of that. Yes, yeah. exactly. Which lands us in the place of greater healing and connection to each other and to the world. So that's really what the book is about, helping couples walk around that wheel in a conscious way and some practices to do when they get stuck. Yeah, I love the book. I, in terms of, I haven't actually put it into place. I'm like, might have to call you for the singles coaching. Um, but what I love, because the pain bit, isn't it? The, you know, the, the, you know that, that decision-making point, because at the pain point, that's usually we go on the, you know, the pain mat and get out of the relationship into the same yes. cycle, don't we? Whereas that it point, can, if yes. we can go into the love map and go, okay, you yeah, do the work and actually be in this relationship and work on this and... Um, yeah. yeah, and merge into that north. Yeah, and in some ways, it's not the easier choice, right? It's, you know, I mean, I did it for years. I, it would get hard and I would leave. I'd be like, out of here, next, mm. you know, and I'd fall in love all over yeah. again. Yeah. And, you know, I was on that hamster wheel for a couple decades mm. before I was like, okay, I'm going to do something different now. Yeah. So, and there's nothing wrong with ending a relationship that's not working. Mm, right? For sure, for sure. For sure. Mm. But what you said is absolutely right. Most of the time we take those patterns with us into the next relationship anyway. Mm. So, you know, the question really is, is it worth it to you to stay in this relationship? Mm. And do you have a partner who's willing yes. to do mm. you? Mm. That's a very important question because a lot of times I hear from people, well, my partner doesn't want to do their own work. And it's like, there's very, there's very little place to go when both people aren't willing to do their own work. You just keep you're on that pain map over and over again, and it hurts. What about when one wants to and one doesn't? Yeah, well, that's want? usually yeah. the case. That's yeah. usually the case. So, you know, what I usually say to people is, um, 
there's usually a risk for the person who doesn't want to do their own work. And if they're willing to explore what is that risk, you know, is it that, what are the, what are they afraid of? You know, are they afraid that they're going to get stuck in their own personal pain and, and not be able to get out? Are they afraid that the relationship is just going to become too much work? Like, like what is that pain point? Because there's a reason why there's a reason why they don't want to do their own work. And if you can, gently explore that sometimes with the help of a counselor they could have a breakthrough mm -hmm. once they see you no know, the relationship that i really want is actually on the other side mm -hmm. of me stepping through to do my own personal work mm -hmm. and i think for some people um you know for me and for mark it was really clear that we didn't want to be in a relationship with someone that wasn't willing to do their own work so i think you know sometimes people make that choice too they're like you know i i can't be in a relationship with someone who's not willing to do their own work but you have to make sure you're looking at yourself when yeah. you say that <laughs> yeah. you know you yeah. have to make sure that you are doing your own work and not just saying well they're not doing their own work you know so oh, well you know it takes two people <laughs> yeah 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 everything happens in a relationship yeah everything uh, happens yeah. in a relationship that's true nice. yes. And what do you just in terms of what, so what do you think in terms of the collective conversation around what we need to step into around, you know, deepening our connection with ourselves or each other and the earth, you know, is there a, what's your, what's your take? Have you got a sort of a big question? Oh big gosh. Question? You know, you know, where do you go with it? It's difficult looking at the state of the world these days and seeing the, I mean, I really do think it's dis, there's so much disconnection, you know, and that if we were more connected with ourselves and with each other and with the earth, the things would look completely different. It's hard, it's hard not to come to that conclusion, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think it comes back to a, a willingness though. I think there are a lot of people who aren't, who aren't willing to look more deeply and, and do their own work. And there's, there's all this reactivity right now. Mm -hmm. You know, I see all this reactivity to things that are happening. We could, you know, we could name seven different huge issues that are happening in the world right now. Part of it's slowing down. You know, I find that, that the world moves at such a fast pace these days that there's a reluctance to actually slow down and listen. I think that's a big issue. You know, I, I, I um, when I do work with people in the corporate world, you know, I have to ramp myself up. They're usually moving at a pace that's two to three times. And they're always like, oh, I'm so busy. I don't have time. I don't even have time to be on this call. How much time do we have? And I find myself going, wow, this really is the state of the world right now. Yeah. This constant addiction to achievement and getting twice as much done in a day as we were meant to get done. And that's out of balance with the natural rhythm. You know, that's, that's out of balance. So even just asking people to slow down and listen seems at this point in our human evolution like a big ask yeah. you know it seems like a big ask and it's so simple it's and it's available to all of us mm. and in a down. micro moment isn't it you know it's sort of like just you were saying about the regulation you know, it's a micro moment of two breaths or a minute or a longer period have you noticed during sort of COVID or anything during this year that you've seen a change in that of people? So I have heard people say things like, gosh, being home is so nice. I get, I've noticed my pace is a little different and I get to be with my kids differently. And I do think if, if there's any opportunity out of this pandemic, that that may be one is mm -hmm. to actually start looking at our pace and, I, I like what you said. I like micro moments. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good, a good phrase. So anything apart from a pause, any other you know, tip that you want to leave us with? Like a good consultant? <laughs> you know, honestly, I think because we can, we can get so, um, it's like the motion I want to do is like this. We can get so constricted. Yeah right? Yeah. Whether, whether it's something in ourself mm -hmm. or it's something with our partner, you know, we try to kind of figure it out and yeah. we get, we get yeah. like this. So tight. So we get yeah. tight. Mm -hmm. And um, if you can even just find, find a few moments once a week 
to take that out into nature. Just take whatever that is, that constriction, that question, that confusion, take it to the land. You know, that's what we, that's what we say yeah. in our relationship. Let's yeah. take it take to it the to land. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Take it to the land, yeah. take it to the mama. Yeah. And, um, and just see what else comes. You know, when you, when you undo that constriction just a little bit and you go, okay, I'm here to listen. I'm going to listen now. And in that moment of openness, something new always comes. I'm gonna, I don't use the word always very often, but I'm just going to yeah, say Yeah, yeah, you can claim it. I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah, I'll back you. I do. Something I new you. always comes. Yeah, it's true. It's just even physics, you know, I don't know much about physics, but just that sort of literally, the sort of energetically, something's got to come in different. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. And actually, it's a lovely image of actually going out to see tightness and how tightness in the in the land or in nature and how if you sit with it long enough how itself will open anything mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. and that's a nice you just came up with a medicine walk mm. i did i'm gonna yeah because oh. <laughs> <laughs> i yes i've been thinking about i've had conversations today about openness and sort of like i need to yeah i feel like i'm gonna do that well thank you for that <laughs> There you go. There you go. Oh, anything else you want to leave us with, or anything you, that we haven't sort of explored, or no? I think you know so if people want to. Wanna, yeah. It, yeah. I mean, there's obviously a lot, but yeah. if people want to find out more about our work, they can yeah. just go to transformativeloving.com. Yeah. And um, you know, the book is available on Amazon, mm -hmm. the Love Map. And I just, you know, I. It's, it's challenging times right now. And I really feel for couples who are doing their best to navigate all these waters, yeah. you know, there's just so much. And also for singles who are longing yeah. to be in intimate relationship in a good way. And I just, I just send blessings and I, I know it's available. I know it's available. Yeah, just, well, you're the proof. You're the damn little proof. And, but I love living through it. I love also, you know, this virtual. So I'll definitely put all your all the, the links in the episode and uh, people can reach out for you. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you so much for asking because I know, um, you know, I know we're not the only ones doing couples work and bringing nature in, but I do think it's a lesser explored area. I think a lot of this work is done kind of individually. So I just, Absolutely. I love... I love the, the co-regulation that's available with nature. And so mm -hmm. I just, I, I hope that if there are any couples who are watching this, just take that as a little seed yes. to um, just, go, just go sit together. Yeah, I love that, that co-regulation in nature. And of course, of course I'd ask you, you know, because I do want um, part of me doing this is actually to honor the people that I've met on my path who have inspired me. And, so you're one of them. So thank you so much, Jeannie. Give my love oh, to Mark. I've never met. What a delight. One day. Well, next year well, when I come to bowl, well, when I come around those parts, I'll I'll drop please. in. Please. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Please yeah. do. That would be great. Hopefully, we'll be in a house by then, and we'll have a room <laughs> where you can stay. <laughs> or we can go outside. We will take it to the land. <laughs> We'll take your house search to the land and I'm sure uh, I, we have actually. Yeah. We've done ceremony around yeah. it. So. Well it will happen at its right time. Thank yes. you so much and take Thank care you. and uh, yeah. See you around. Thank you. I hope you feel nourished by this conversation. I certainly do. We'll pause here and see you back for the next Earth Converse podcast. In the meantime, go out and enjoy nature. One conversation.